bubbles, dark basement, scuttles, and grenades. Hey, witches. I had the pleasure of interviewing one of my favorite necromancing witches today. But before we get into that, just wanted to remind everyone to check out our website, greatnorthwitches.com, and be sure to subscribe there. Hi, everyone. I'm here with Aiden, and we are doing our interview today to get to know her a little better. I hope you guys are all excited. And we always start out with the question about what kind of witch are you? That is a good question. Well, I t typically just say I do necromancy and I work with the ancestors. I'm just a witch of the land. Well, it was interesting because we were talking about what we were going to say here today. And we were kind of getting into the fact that you have so multiple lineages. Yeah. How challenging that can be for pulling yourself into one practice. Would you like to tell us a little bit about, you know, your different backgrounds? Mm hmm I am both mostly Western European and indigenous lines, indigenous to Turtle Island, North America. So most of my indig uh, indigenous lines are Eastern. There's one that is Western all the way out from uh, Rocky Mountain, Alberta. My European lines, all again, Westerns. Uh, the more dominant line is the French. Got a lot of French in there. We got some Basque, Welsh and Irish and a bit of German in there. We're quite the Heinz 57. Is that a term? I haven't heard that one. <laughs> it's the ketchup. That's I know it's 57 tomatoes. Is that why they call yeah. it Heinz 57? Just yeah. learn something new. That's it. I just call us mutts. But there you go. <laughs> that works too. And so do you find when you're trying to figure out what you're doing with your witchcraft practice, is it either influential subconsciously or do you find yourself trying to dig into those to draw from? So originally, when I first started my craft, I tried to use from my backgrounds, at least the more known and talked about backgrounds, where at the time, my family mostly just talked about our French, Irish, and German backgrounds, because throughout the generation, that's what we were told to strictly say we are. So I tried Celtic paganism, I tried Celtic witchcraft, I tried Celtic Wicca back when I was trying out Wicca. And it just always felt forced. And I didn't understand why, because we do have strong Celtic roots directly from Ireland. But it just, it still didn't feel like it for me. And it felt like I was just force feeding myself that. And I tried the same thing with Norse. Yeah, it, it was very hard. And then even when we started to learn more about our indigenous heritage and our Métis heritage. And maybe explain for people who aren't from Canada. Oh, yes. So Métis is a specific indigenous peoples in Canada. Métis originally meant half indigenous, half white. So usually it was a indigenous woman and a white man because it was fur traders who were going across Canada and they would marry indigenous women. That's a very basic term. Because I think um, there were some other variations of what Métis is. Yes, well. and it's very, very political um, <laughs> as most indigenous stuff in Canada is absolutely it's 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 an onion lots of peeling layers and a lot of yeah a lot of debates unfortunately because there's a lot of politics saying that Métis can now only strictly be from the west when there are traces of Métis having originated in the east um, yeah I was gonna say because I think our family has it from Quebec region or something like that. Yeah, and even Louis Riel wrote in a letter that mixed people were also Métis. So there's... Now to the listeners who might, you know, totally disagree with that, I am not a hundred percent like yes this is my personal belief about it i'm just saying that there are multiple political viewpoints about the metis identity and unfortunately money plays a big part into it as to mm -hmm. who gets to pick what pick what the it terms means. are yeah. yeah and it's interesting having this conversation for me personally having some of that background but obviously no mental connection to that heritage yeah it's tricky to figure out with witchcraft, and I know we've talked in past episodes about gatekeeping and the idea that you're not allowed to do, practice certain things or do certain things. Do you find that held you back from digging into the indigenous stuff for a while because there was that concern about politically going the wrong way? 
Absolutely. It was a big thing, a big factor in like the imposter syndrome, mm-hmm. even though my family knew we, we were always, quote, mixed. And we even had uh, other family members who had actual Métis Nations of Ontario memberships who were originally recognized until 2016. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were valid all of a sudden until 2016. Um, and so the imposter syndrome comes from, well, if I have no, no more living community ties, who gets to vouch for me to say, yes, you are Indigenous or yes, you are Métis? And I have to be careful not to call myself Indigenous. Mm-hmm. I am Indigenous descent, but Métis, I, I am. We have our direct lineage and everything. But that's how political it gets. It's, it's is that you so, literally have to be parsing down. Like Yeah. So, you literally have to walk around with papers showing your genealogy. <laughs> you literally have to objectify and tokenize your genealogy now, your ancestors. To be considered. To be considered valid. Mm. Um, and in a way, I can understand because a lot of people have claimed Métis based off of nothing, just off of stories in their family. And they claimed a lot of funding. That's specifically reserved for Métis, mm-hmm. for Indigenous people. And some of them had their entire schooling paid only to be yeah. exposed as to not having any ties whatsoever. So there's that risk. But on a yeah. witchcraft level, yeah. do you think if you took away all the politics mm-hmm. that you would, like, I know you do have some practices, are there parts of that that really speak to you if you let go of yeah, the stories that of what you are and aren't allowed to be. A lot of it does speak to me because it is, you know, it was Métis beliefs became folk practices. So it became like a lot of them adapted folk Catholicism in order to safely merge indigenous beliefs with the Catholic faith. Which is what Catholicism does frequently in exactly. any area it rises up. What specifically is considered folk Catholicism? So a lot of them adapted things like uh, prayer in the more Christian form, but still praying to creator instead of calling it God. God. Okay. A lot of them uh, still use traditional medicine in their prayer. A lot of them, uh, oh, it's a huge thing, um, at least it was back in the day. Métis also have something like a dumb supper. Oh, like what? Yeah, we do. Yeah. The Halloween. Through Catholicism, I guess it would be All Saints or All Souls Day or something like that. Everyone's, yeah, I got their names. <laughs> yeah, and apparently though Métis, like some, I can't say it was every one of them, but many of them held that belief of putting an extra plate at the table for mm. ancestors of past loved ones to come. But, you know, it was it was disguised as All Souls Day or All Saints Day. Yeah. So it's OK, right? It's not witchcraft. What I love about digging back through the history of holidays. Yeah. It's so interesting that a group of people who were not deep into European, any mm-hmm. they didn't have any contact with that, still were aware enough that the veil was thin. Yeah. You know, like that, that's just such a subconscious understanding that they yeah. didn't need someone to tell them it's, you know, time to feed your, your relatives. <laughs> They're just feeding them. And I think I really connect to connecting with that ancestry as well, because it's shown me that practices could come unique, new practices could come one, both out of merging two different belief systems, belief systems, two different cultures, but also coming, you know, uh, you, you think of the newcomers, the settlers, the colonizers, how a lot of them who did maybe low key practice witchcraft, they had to adapt. And how did you adapt? You learned from the indigenous people. And so next thing you know, you were using their medicine and that's how you could continue on your craft, whether it was witchcraft or not. That's how you survived. And so these, these, these new slash old practices emerged and I found it created something completely unique where it's old and new at the same time. Hmm. So I felt like I could connect to that a lot more than force feeding myself uh, Celtic witchcraft because I'm part Irish, but I'm not Irish. I'm not from Ireland. You didn't grow up there, right? So. I didn't grow up there, and I, I don't work with that land. Yeah. But I'm born here, and I can connect to the energies of this land. And I feel like an, I, I can actually raise something. I don't feel like I'm reaching for something that I might never... Understand Understand, yeah. yeah. 
do you think there's a benefit to introducing people who are not of any Indigenous or Métis background to that culture or that practice so that they appreciate the land more? Yes. And of course, there's a huge difference between cultural appreciation and appropriation. Um, I have non-blood related Ojibwe uncles and, you know, they always said we need to share the culture or else it dies out. Mm. And yes, indigenous peoples themselves can continue on with the culture, but now we are a mixed nation and there's various cultures coming in that have been coming in uh, on this land for, for centuries now. And so if people don't know about indigenous cultures one they might be afraid of it label it as witchcraft which like is not you know like the hollywood bad satanic witchcraft um they might be less tolerant towards it they they'll have all uh these misunderstandings and bias about it but also if you don't speak a language it gets lost and so Mm -hmm. i don't you know even my uncle said that like the language shouldn't just be for indigenous people in fact people who have come to this country to this land should have and should learn the languages that of the land they are on because that's what you do when you come into someone's home you learn their ways and that's just the more that's the real whitewashing that went on though exactly replacing the culture instead of amalgamating the culture And so I think there's a huge benefit because one, it keeps the culture alive. But of course, people who are not indigenous or not of indigenous descent do need to remember the difference between appropriation and appreciation. Appreciation is you're learning the language, you know, like you're you're learning the language is acknowledging the culture and the people who were here before. Appropriation is, let's say you make yourself a quote native name and try to make your own translation and then start introducing yourself as this (laughs) uh purple flower mystic woman (laughs) yeah it's a somebody's it reminds me of the the whatever movie with i'm the captain now yeah it's like yeah i'm the native now it's like that's not how that works (laughs) but literally that's what's been happening right and so with sharing the culture, there is that line that needs to be remembered. And even for me, I'm indigenous descent, but I, I can't just walk into a powwow and ask to be a jingle dress dancer. I don't belong to a specific community that can claim me and teach me that medicine that can vouch for me that I am of them. And so I can go to a powwow and appreciate it. Uh, I can admire it. If I'm invited to dance, which they do all the time in powwows, I'll invite people, random people, to just dance for a few minutes. Absolutely, that's appreciation. But appropriation would be me making a jingle dress. And showing up. Showing up, claiming to be of a specific nation that I'm not even recognized, nobody knows me. And then competing in the dances. I think it's challenging for people who are majority white because essentially part of white culture is just doing whatever you want and taking whatever you want. Traditionally, not, I'm not saying every person's like that now, but historically Mm -hmm. europeans just go where they want and do what they want right yeah it's interesting to me the whole idea because it's like on one hand as someone who has some roots but doesn't obviously have any mental heritage to hold on to it's like i do understand like i've talked to you before i'll say something like that's my spirit animal which just means that shows up a lot in my life Mm -hmm. but on one hand i also know it's like when i'm saying that you know, you get in that weird mindset. It's the same as we were just doing where it's like, okay, I'm this kind of Métis, but I'm not into like, yeah, where you're like, it can get a little overwhelming because so much of witchcraft is supposed to be about claiming what's true for you. Yeah. And it's hard to walk the line. I think of claiming what's true for you without claiming what's not actually yours. Exactly. Yeah. That That's what I liked about finally this year, really figuring out what my practice really was. And that it wasn't an actual path and that why I never also felt that eclectic was 100% true because... Yeah, explain that because we did talk about that. The way that I figured out my craft is that all these years, sure, I've been practicing since I was 14, but it was a lot of trial and error of what feels right. And it's like, is this where my calling is bringing me? Like, no, this Celtic path isn't working for me. I'm not, you know, of an indigenous nation, so, like, I can't just use their ways. Claim it all. Claim it all and practice that. 
I also have to be careful to label indigenous practices as witchcraft. Because they're not. Because uh, they're, yes. they're not, and they've been called that to be demonized. You know, same with my German ancestry. Like, it's just, I tried, and it just didn't feel right. So the issue with the word eclectic, though, because mm-hmm. that's what we were talking about. So, yeah, the issue of the word eclectic is that eclectic means the mixing of different paths okay. or pulling from, merging different paths together. So I've seen, like, and it doesn't even have to be, like, pagan or witch paths. It can be, like, I've seen people say that they're Celtic practitioners, but then they also incorporate things like Reiki, which is Japanese, I believe. Um, yeah, I don't actually. That's funny. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> but it's something East. Yeah, and aspects of Buddhism and this and that, and then they make their own spiritual, like their eclectic spiritual practice. It doesn't yeah. have to be witchcraft, but it's an eclectic practice. And I notice that I still, even though like I, I've tried to study those different select paths, uh, I still couldn't pull from them because again, I didn't relate to them. I tried Ogham reading, which is like a a tr- an old tree language apparently like an old gaelic tree divination style didn't work i tried working with north ruins go back explain the tree one <laughs> okay so Ogham, if i'm even pronouncing it right it's like it's lines and they form they form these symbols i guess am and i killing a tree to get this though how am i getting this from the tree or looking in the bark no so i guess like um it's like ruins basically okay. yeah. i've never heard of this at all so this is okay yeah. yeah it's very gaelic i'm gonna say irish scottish okay and so it's like their form of ruins i guess and are they made they're made out of wood yes okay yeah they're supposed to be at totally least. following along yeah it's all good. <laughs> what are we dividing now i'm like i have it's like if i drop a leaf of lettuce and then read what it means is that interpret like am i doing divination Okay, so, um, so I, I tried incorporating aspects of those specific paths, and I just I couldn't connect to them. I think a lot of witches can relate to that, where it's yeah hard to figure out what's you, yeah, and what's just trend or exactly. what's exactly. You know. So I couldn't relate to specific practices of specific paths, like again the Celtic, the Norse. But what I could relate to was my own distinct practices that came of learning my ancestry and what i mean by that is that i have been here ancestral wise for hundreds of years whereas i've met a lot of friends who are born canadian but let's say their grandparents were from europe my ancestry has been here you're a canadian witch yeah for for (laughs) centuries even my first first french ancestors who came to this land we were one of the fades du roi which was one of the women that the king sent over to Quebec, which was New France at the time, yeah. uh, to help, quote, colonize. Colonize, yeah. That was, like, early 1600s. Like, that was 1600s. It's like the Mayflower time, like, the, yeah. for the English people. That was our... It's, we're very divided in Canada, French yeah. and English, so we oh, all have yeah. our own story. <laughs> yeah, there's a huge history of Francophones. The Francophone and, and Anglos. Yeah, yeah. and... Same with my Irish ancestors, my German ancestry to my Basque ancestry is from like 1700s. Yeah. Um, so in some way, investigating all this, you found on some level that you're I'm, Canadian. <laughs> that I'm, I'm Canadian. I'm Turtle Islander, we'll say. Uh, for those who don't know, Turtle Island is a term used by Indigenous people across North America, possibly South America as well, because uh, that was the original name of this land. And so that's their reclaimed name now, too. And it's, I, there's so many different teachings as to why it's called Turtle Island. I was going to say, because I was like, they include all of North America. I'm like, I guess that's like the turtle back. Yeah. But it's weird, to, although maybe, but they wouldn't have seen what it looks like from space anyway. Exactly. So. <laughs> so maybe there's, the Great Canadian Shield, because it's got like a maybe, lump on it. I, I don't maybe. stuff up now. This is, but also turtles are a huge part of indigenous Oh, uh, uh, really? Because they're stories. part of the world's origin story, isn't it? Yes. A big part? Okay. And their shells, um, if you count the different shells, Shell shapes, pieces, whatever, yeah. shapes, they make up a woman's month cycle. Oh, they have 13. Uh, yeah, they have 20 something, 21, 27. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, they make up how many days in between? Yeah. Sorry, I'm being super yeah. analytical. I'm like, oh, wait, how good. many numbers? Can I keep a turtle on me? So I'm like, wait, what day are we? <laughs> yeah, so turtles are heavily associated with womanhood as well, and in indigenous culture as well. Very big part of the creation story. But I'm just 
literally of this land. And that's where I felt that peace this year when I found, like, when I just came, like, I, I thought of this term, of the land, and I am of the land. My indigenous ancestors have been here since who knows when, <laughs> so, yeah. for thousands and thousands of years. And then my European ancestry hasn't been in Europe for hundreds of years. And so I'm literally just of this land. And so I found that I started to develop my own distinct ways of, of doing things. Just it, it started to make me finally feel at ease, like I was finding my path and that it was not a path created before. Because there is, you can look up Canadian witchcraft, maybe there's a book. That could be American witchcraft or Canadian witchcraft are about authors. Or about European witchcraft. That about European here. Yeah. witchcraft that was brought here. And so it was practiced the same way, but here. Yeah. So it's not genuinely of this land. And yeah. so I really, my Métis heritage really started to help me become at peace with that because of how they've adapted and created their own distinct beliefs and cultures and practices. Although me and my mom always knew we were mixed and we knew we were of Métis heritage because our families for generation were, were told to hush hush about it. Besides some of those members who had the Métis registrations, we didn't get to grow up close to the culture. We felt imposter syndrome diving into that, but at least learning about that heritage and us finally getting to know our heritage and our culture and not feeling like we're in the wrong place for doing so, it's allowed me to say it's okay to completely have my own distinct witchcraft. That's just what it is. And You've it's, a, it's given a, yourself permission. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That I, it, it doesn't have to be a, a preset path for it to be valid because I, I think about it now and people survived on this land adapting and creating new medicine even though again to indigenous people probably wasn't new but if we were looking uh through the lens of a settler a settler or colonizer it, it was new medicine and it worked and that's they were discovering their path just like exactly we're doing now because witchcraft is having a renaissance or a, yeah. a revival however you want to call it right exactly and i don't want to i don't want to crap on anyone who follows a, a european path I, mm -hmm. it's great if that's what gives you power maybe your ancestry line is very strong through that path and that's why you feel like you actually can pull your power from that path that's fine i'm not saying that oh you're on canadian land now you have to you're now a canadian witch <laughs> yeah and you cannot work with celtic energies i mean you go to newfoundland and there's strong celtic oh influence. it's super strong there yeah, yeah like East their Coast, accent is still there <laughs> it's still there it never left yeah. uh, it just kept breeding into it yeah um you know like there like to me my logic that would make sense like you want to do some merging of folk celtic and maybe indigenous or this and that like that would make so much sense well and um, it speaks to the need because i always talk about you know connecting with like your cycle and your energy stuff it's like yeah. where you are should impact how you practice exactly and a big part of that when i was first entering the craft that was bothering me so for people who don't know when i first entered exploring witchcraft i was doing it through the lens of wicca and again, no hate against Wicca. It's just not what I do. If anything, it guided me to where I am now. It was just so annoying because our days don't get longer the same date and time as it does in Europe. We have a long winter. We have a long different yeah. like winter. And so like we're, you know, in Celtic tradition, I'm just using Celtic because it's like the most popular, well-known path. Well, and of... Wicca pulled a lot from the Celtic traditions. Exactly. So there's a lot of correlation. Yeah, and so like we're celebrating a a Sabbath of fertility and but Minus winter forty <laughs> Ottawa. Yeah, <laughs> when we're still when we should be shifting the Sabbath Our accordingly. Traditions. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the one issue I was really having with it, and I was like, Kate, hey, like this isn't right. Like we can't be celebrating something for fertility in the middle of like the dead season. Yeah. It didn't feel because you're obviously more connected because I yeah. think there are some witches that probably don't have that physical connection as strongly. Yeah. So maybe it's, and as an astrologer, I'm, I'm celebrating like when the sun causes the equinox. Yeah. So, so it's like, it's not even about the weather for me. Right. Yeah. Like exactly. So there's all these different ways, but it's interesting that you're coming in touch with, that part of you yeah 
your mom and you are both coming into this kind of at the same time do you find you're both following the same path or you can you see differences in what she's doing we're very similar okay. and we've always thought very alike and a lot of times we'd find that out by saying like one of us would admit to something and the other one was like you know what yeah <laughs> i was feeling the same way so how my mom came into witchcraft is that she came into witchcraft at the same age I did, at 14. Oh, wow. But she was raised by a mother whose sisters were Catholic nuns. Oh, wow. <laughs> and at least one of them was a Catholic nun, and my grandmother was heavily Catholic. They grew up in a small village of Noelville, so that explains a lot. And so she had to stop her exploration of that because they would raid her room. And they would throw out anything, even if it was just, like, metal music and stuff like that. My mom was very, like, punk rocker in her younger <laughs> days. And so not much survived except a pendant that she passed on to me at 14. And she basically, it was almost like for her to be like, I didn't get to do it, so I'm breaking that cycle and I'm letting you explore. But over the years of me kind of paving that path, she felt comfortable exploring it again um, because she stopped caring what people would think. We started to do more things together. We eventually even had like our own room in our basement specifically for us to do witchcraft. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And a lot of it, I feel like we couldn't connect because of our identities, because everyone seemed to connect so well to Greek or Celtic pantheons or North. And me and my mom were always like, yeah, I guess it's okay for now to give us something to go on. But it still never felt like it. It still never felt like us. You've told me stories about you've had co-dreams. That's a pretty powerful connection if you guys are... Yeah. Oh my god, we've had very odd... Synchronistic. I would synchronistic say dreams slash other types of divination messages. Oh, here's a cool one. So I once had... It was a violent dream. But it was a dream of a serpent that, I, and I love serpents, but in the dream, unfortunately, the serpent was a bad omen. And I was holding a white weasel, and the white weasel, the serpents and weasels are natural yes. enemies. Yeah. And so the weasel jumped out of my hands and tried to defend me from this massive, like, python or anaconda-like snake. It got torn apart, the weasel, and it was really graphic in the dream. I knew that meant something, and it was so weird. I asked my mom for a reading to help me interpret it. Because your mom does tarot readings. She She's does tarot good. readings, and she has a beautiful deck. It's not the traditional imagery. She pulls a card with a white weasel. No. <laughs> There's been so many other instances like that where sometimes I'll pull cards. I won't tell her, and then she'll pull some of the same cards. And then we'll have sometimes co-dreams, like... And you dreams. guys don't live near each other, so this isn't, no. like, a proximity issue. <laughs> yeah, no, and, like, I live in Ottawa. My mom's in, still in Sudbury right now, so... Still co-dreaming. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So I think we've ju we just have a really strong connection spiritually, and we share a lot of the same gifts, whether it's something because it's passed down, depending on how our... Our astral charts is set up. That's, I was going to say, I'm trying to remember. Prone. I feel like you do have some points to line up in your charts because I know I checked. But I, yeah. <laughs> I can't remember. So we, uh, yeah, we tend to share a lot of those types of abilities. And my mom's just progressed in hers dramatically in the past two years. Yeah. With, do you use tarot as your main form of divination or do you have something else you like better? Uh, I do like cards. I have both my oracle, which is an herbal oracle, which <laughs> makes sense because I am a witch of the land. And with you, I started to learn foraging, which, by the way, that's brought me so much peace because that's a huge part of my witchcraft now. And that's like what I felt like it always should have been. And it's everywhere, right? It's like everywhere. You, there's always so much to learn just yeah. walking outside. It's it's medicine of the land, which yeah. is like a huge part of my ancestry. <laughs> but to get back to divination, yeah, I have tarot, which I'm taking my time to learn. Mm -hmm. But I do want to go more in depth into it once I'm more financially stable. There are very credible teachers out there that I want to purchase programs from. What is it that you feel like you're missing now from your tarot? Just like the deeper understanding of the cards? Or? The, it's more the details. So okay. I really, I know that a lot of the meanings behind tarot can come intuitively, which I'm getting good at that. Same with the oracle. My intuition is coming through pretty well, 
but there's a lot of symbology in the, the traditional tarot imagery. Or hidden symbols. or yeah. yeah, like there's numerology, there's astrology, there's yeah. color coding, there's all that stuff. And I feel like that plays a huge part in the message. So I feel like that's a big part of what I, I just want to learn and get more in depth about. But a huge part of what my mom has done is really develop her intuition to the point that she has now, she now has medium-like abilities. Oh, wow. She's picked up on the dead. She's picked up on people's past loved ones when she's done readings for them. It's, it's insane. And she's picked up on, on things before I even told her. And I was like, it's like she's going to pick up on it. And she, lo and behold, I just she won't did. call her for the next week because I know she'll know. <laughs> yeah. And so that's a lot of things, too. It's like tarot is great. It's, it's a reflection of what you need to look at. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a card. It's a card with an image on it. The way I use divination is that I believe my ancestors or spirit, my guides are behind it. And they're the ones trying to talk to me that way. Um, with my oracle cards the other day, I pulled three cards, didn't rearrange the order. And the three words were enhance dream magic. <laughs> and you sent me that and I was laughing. <laughs> Yeah, and it's like, if that's not a clear message... <laughs> it's like, what does it want? I don't yeah. know. Huh. <laughs> so it's like, you know, there's definitely someone, something, my ancestors that are, are always there when I'm, I need to ask them something. And we should obviously talk about your ancestors. For me, it's such a foreign concept because I don't have that sound in my ear. Like, how do you pick who you're talking to? Is it a general idea of ancestor? Do you ever get into like the gods, goddess stuff? Or is it mostly family? So I love that because that's a huge topic that comes up when people talk about ancestral witchcraft. A lot of people don't. We got lucky, me and my mom that our ancestry is recorded and even our indigenous and Métis lines, they were mostly hidden because of the church. They were given new identities, but we decoded them and we could confirm who they were and what they were. So we got lucky, but for a lot of people who don't get to have that, general ancestry is a great point to start. And through that, if you at least try to decode your genealogy, at least figure out the general areas and peoples you come from, it starts to give them a voice. And then you start to notice that they become more prominent. Symbology of them will become more prominent okay. because you're, you're starting to open up that door and giving them a voice again, even if you don't know who they are yet. For me, I have a set of four ancestors on my altar that you can see right now. I have my great-great-grandfather, my great-great-grandmother, my great-grandmother, and my great-aunt Edna. I've mentioned Edna before. Um, she is a protector. She is, she is fierce. <laughs> uh, many of the men who've harmed me in my life would agree. The way I came about those four specific ancestors is that Edna specifically, I always heard stories about her. And the more I grew up, the more I realized I had very similar uh, personality characteristics to her. And I was very driven the same way she was. And when I was younger, we were clearing my grandparents' home after my grandfather had died. And I found this picture of a woman, an old picture. And I bring it up to my mom, and I was still a kid. And I said, who's this? And she's like, that's your great aunt Anna. That's my aunt. And she started to tell me stories about her, about how she was a force to be reckoned with. Every kid was afraid of her. She was a teacher, and she had no issue putting a class in order. And strong personality. Very strong, a woman way ahead of her time. And even my mom was like super intimidated by her as a kid. And I just, I remember that was the day that I liked her. <laughs> I, my mom was scared shitless of her, but I liked this woman that I've never met, but I felt like I knew her. And turns out that's probably because she decided to watch over me when I was born. Essentially, yeah. when a man wrongs you... <laughs> And this is, I mean, guys, you got to get an ancestor like this. We oh, all, yes. We all need one like this. But when a man wrongs you, they often get cursed. Yes. <laughs> so but did Edna have a cur bad thing happen to her? Is that so, her sympathy? Edna, I hope I have your blessing to tell your story. So what happened with Edna is that I believe I inherited a curse that she laid out. I inherited her as a powerful guardian, but I also inherited this, which actually is not a bad thing. So Edna had her heart broken. It was said that she had one love only in her life. It turns out that she was 
an affair. She she was in love with a man that was using her as an affair. Unfortunately, she got pregnant, and back in those days, you could not get pregnant out of wedlock. In, I hear that was a thing, yeah. In a Catholic town, and so she had to give up her daughter in secrecy. Unfortunately, her daughter died young, I believe like at between 8 and 12, and I can only imagine not being able to grieve openly as a mother. And the man like ended up marrying another woman, and apparently she was never the same since. She changed. Something just ticked in her. You know, I, as I've started to explore my sexuality and I started to finally date men, I noticed every one of them who broke my heart. You're allowed like, to break their heart, though, right? Yeah. Okay. Just want to know. Every one of them who broke my heart, their life went to shit. <laughs> and three of them lost their absolute minds, like complete mental breakdowns and quite a few of them all lost their jobs well all of them who lost their minds lost their jobs there's one guy who got what he put out so basically like he exploited women and i was one of them and next thing you know oops a picture of him turned up at his workplace and it's a it's a revealing picture it's a it's a vulnerable picture which is funny because you had nothing literally nothing to do with this nope no, nope. just so. And um, it's funny because he's a Leo, so ego is huge for him. Mm. And the latest man, which <laughs> I'm glad he's alive because we're back together. But Enda made sure that he learned a lesson. And not to get too into it, but he didn't break my heart out of malice. It was just because we both had a major learning curve. However, the curse doesn't distinguish that. <laughs> you break my heart, that's the trigger. You get the curse. <laughs> And so he ended up, oh God, uh, the first thing that ended up happening is that he ended up falling sick, I believe. I thought you were bit by a dog first. No. Oh, that was after. Uh, Trying to keep track. There's a lot of curse here. Oh, no, wait. You know what? Yeah. So what first happened is that he got in trouble with work. So I can't say where he works, but it's a place where uniform is strict. Yeah. And he was going to take his official photos for his work. And out of nowhere, all of his appropriate uniform pants rip in the crotch. <laughs> so he couldn't use those. So he had to use his old work pants from another branch of that type of work. That ruffled the feathers of the superior, and he got told about it. Right there, his reputation took a blow, and he was still pretty new at that position. So that caused a bit of a ruffle. Whatever. That's not too bad. <laughs> he's still alive. We're good. He's still alive. <laughs> Then he gets mauled by a dog at work. And, and he's afraid of dogs. And that, yeah, he is afraid of dogs. Yet dogs are one of my biggest um, animals, my biggest helpers. One of your, yeah, because you have your big tattoo of. Yeah, I have a big guard dog tattoo on my stomach. Yeah. Um, it's my justice tattoo, I like to call it. And he gets mauled by a dog. His entire arms, both arms, all the way up almost to the shoulders, are full of dog bite puncture wounds. And he does not work with dogs. He doesn't That's work with the dogs. Part. <laughs> it's not, no. He's not a vet, people. <laughs> no. It was done at work, but like that type of job, there's not usually a dog there. Yes. Just and... a lucky day, I guess. <laughs> and then, but wait, there's more. <laughs> he's still alive, people. It's okay. He's, he's still alive, <laughs> if you can believe it. Yeah. Then he ends up getting sick. He ends up getting stomach issues and heart issues. He ends up passing out in his own gym with 200 pounds on his shoulders because he was squatting. He wakes up like an hour or two hours later. Um, and you guys are young. Like, he's not... He's only 29. Yeah, this is not yeah. an 80-year-old man where you're going, yeah, this happens. And he goes to the hospital, finds out he has two stomach ulcers. He's part Italian, and so he has to cut out all his tomato-based foods and his coffee. <laughs> It's a hard life, really. It's a hard life. <laughs> and that's not it. No, no. His ex came back with a junction saying that she, apparently she's owed money. <laughs> yeah, and this was like year, a year or two after they'd been together. Oh, like, like this is... So he broke up with her a, quite a while ago. Like him and I have been together a, almost a year. And he broke up with her, I think, the year before. And so this is like two years. Of just everything suddenly piling on. Yeah. And through a lawyer, he gets a panicked call through his lawyer's office. 
saying that oh my god like your ex just sent in this i don't even thing. have a lawyer it's super impressive to me that people yeah <laughs> this is how bad his luck is he had a lawyer ready for this and so now he's fighting that and he still doesn't even know what exactly this is for so he's left hanging with no answers about this just that there's this suspense so it's funny because again like i never told him i practice witchcraft or that we are witches in my family but he literally calls me one day and we're talking and he's like, did you put a curse on me? <laughs> Are you that mad at me? I was like, I didn't. No. <laughs> Not I specifically. I feel like there should be paperwork when you start dating people where yeah. they like sign and they're like, Are you willing to receive a curse? <laughs> yeah. So good thing is that he didn't lose his mind. Yeah. He's Maybe like, he's already lost it a long time ago. But you're, so. you're dating again, so you might have staved off the worst of it. Who exactly. knows? Exactly. I, I did ask Edna to go easy on him. Oh. Like, I didn't want him dead. <laughs> so I think she, she understood the assignment. She, she terrorized him enough. I always love talking about the witch gift, but this isn't actually your witch gift. This is just like an ancestral gift. Inheritance? Uh, cur- curse, <laughs> great gift. Uh, yeah. So what's your actual witch gift? Charisma. I can walk in almost anywhere and make a rapport with people. It's helped me get jobs on the spot. It's helped me get all kinds of opportunities. I don't want to say where because I feel like I was very cringe back then, but I, I was all over the radio for like LGBT activism and stuff like that. Like my face was everywhere and it's very easy for me to get there, which is funny now because I'm trying to keep a lower profile. Well, it's but, funny because you've said before, and I've teased you, because you're like, oh, I walked in and I was just going to sit in the back corner. I was like, yeah, yeah, that'll work. I can sit in the darkest corner and people will still seek me out just to, like, get to know me. Well, and it's, it's funny because whenever I go out with you, it's like, people stop yeah. to tell you stuff. And of course, me, Scorpio Moon, I'm like, fuck. <laughs> like, I've had people tell me their most gruesome trauma while I'm just in an elevator. No. Um, <laughs> But but that's your gift is you pull people towards you. Yeah, and I can make it work in my favor. Another big part is manifestation. Like I've moved to Ottawa with nothing. Yeah. Um, I, I started from zero with just my best friend here. I had no ties to get a job here, which is what you need nowadays. Am I rich right now? No. But I know my manifestation is working and that I'm going to get where I want to be. Not that I want to be rich, rich, but it's like... Stable. Healthy, stable. Happy. Yeah, and I want this specific job that I'm manifesting for right now, things are working and I'm able to manifest that really well. Again, right now I'm not living in some beautiful mansion. I'm living in my one bedroom apartment in an old building, but I'm making it until I get to that. And that's just it. I'm good at manifesting things like quick cash spells, quick job spells to sustain me temporarily while you're trying to go where you're going exactly and i've always been very good at that um every time my friends or my parents needed a bit of extra cash made it happen i mean i find everyone in the group is powerful yeah and so it's so interesting because everyone's got their like niche like oh i just make this happen i'm like yeah it's pretty cool is there anything else because i'm going to get you to read the last paragraph you wrote yes okay if that's okay with you yeah when we were preparing for this interview, Aiden wrote up a little bit about what her practice is just to help me figure out what to talk to her about and make sure that we really got the most out of this. I wanted her to read the last paragraph that she wrote just on our way out the door here. I want Aiden to uh, finish off with this. To conclude, I wouldn't label my craft as eclectic, but instead a direct result of being born on this land as a clean slate, ready to be painted with its own distinct patterns and colors. I am, to put it simply, a great North Witch. I love that so much. And that's it for Aiden's interview. Be sure to check us out on greatnorthwitches.com and subscribe there. Or join us on our Facebook group, Great North Witches Collective. And we'll see you next time. Bubbles. Dark basement. Scuttles. Grenades.